All right. Welcome back, everyone. So if you've been wondering, like many of us have been for a long time, where's Durham? Well, Durham has just emerged. Uh, this is John Durham, the special counsel who was appointed during the Trump presidency to investigate Crossfire Hurricane, the spy scandal uh, that, of course, looked into his campaign and started FBI investigations and then was never fully revealed the, the full story of it to the American public. Durham was the special counsel appointed to investigate this, and Durham has not come out with a charge. Charges against a lawyer, or former former lawyer, for both the DNC and uh, for the Clinton campaign. Uh, it's going to be interesting. A few, a few important points I want to go into in just a bit on this, why this is a big deal, because, folks, this could be a very big deal. Uh, the individual is only being charged with... Uh, the individual who is it being charged right now. His only charge is lying to the FBI. We'll see if it holds up. But there's some very interesting details about this. I'll be going into it just a bit. Uh, folks, also, something else is happening right now. As we're allegedly entering a new stage of this pandemic when, well, they're saying a new wave of the virus is going to come out and possibly cause a lot of damage if people allegedly don't get their vaccines, we're also seeing something interesting that as one of the narratives being used to push for these is overcrowding in hospitals, hospitals are having to fire or lay off so many employees that some of them are actually even closing down. You're having significant shortages in some places of hospital workers, uh, one of the side effects of the vaccine mandate. So we're going into this in other stories in just a bit. Uh, that said, folks, first of all, you might have we might remember this uh, part four of the series of the uh, Dark Origins of Communism series we've been doing. That's coming out very soon. We have a trailer to show you of that. It's going to be very good. Uh, stay tuned. We'll show you real quick what we're working on with it. Communists established power in Russia. After Mussolini, Adolf Hitler then appeared in Germany with the idea of national socialism. Just as Lenin targeted wealthy farmers and the Chinese Communist Party's Mao Zedong targeted landlords, Hitler also targeted a single group of people for his state system to struggle against, the Jews. To say that Nazism, Fascism, and Leninism have nothing to do with socialism or communism is simply untrue. The Antifa organization isn't about targeting real fascism as it claims. Rather, it's a strategy for a power grab. With anti-fascist action, the communists pushed the people into a Nazi system that was still under the socialist ideas that were sweeping the world. All right, well, I'm looking forward to it. I've been wanting to make this for a long time. This is, again, part four now of the Dark Origins of Communism series we've been doing. It's going to be exclusively on Epic TV, epochtv.com forward slash crossroads. Be sure to check it out. Also, if you don't have an account with Epic TV, all you need to watch it is an email address if you want a free trial. That said, folks, let's go to the first story for the night. And then real quick as well, good seeing you all here. Florida girl, good seeing you. He said, hi, Josh. Thank you. <laughs> Shane O'Brien said, don't be a sheep, be a lion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bonnie Aldi said, this will blow up in their faces. The medical field is always needed. The docs and nurses are waking up. No jab. Well, and that's one of the big things with this too, is that medical assessment, the assessment from your doctor used to be taken pretty seriously. Now we're having to bow down to the assessment of the government not of your doctor. And many doctors are actually quitting because they don't want the, they don't want the vaccine. <laughs> Roseanne Dunn, good seeing you. you. said, great series. Thank you. Yeah, folks, good seeing y'all here as always. That's how let's jump into the first story for the night about John Durham, a name we've been waiting to say for a long time. It says here, John Durham's grand jury indicts lawyer who's fir who first, uh, sorry, who's first represented Democrats in 2016. I'm sorry, whose firm represented Democrats in 2016. It says here, Special Prosecutor John Durham has charged Washington-based lawyer Michael Sussman, who represented former president, uh, presidential candidate Hillary Clinton and the Democratic National Committee with lying to the FBI during Clinton's 2016 campaign. Sussman works for the high-powered law firm Perkins Coie, a name many of you may remember, Perkins Coie being one of the major, major 
central pieces in the entire Spygate, a.k.a. Crossfire Hurricane scandal, which has long done legal work for the Democrat Party as well and top Democrats, including filing election-related lawsuits. So interesting now that Perkins Coie is involved with this charge, one of the very first charges, an organization not just involved with the 2016 campaign and the, well, what appears to be illegal spying done against the Trump team, but also folks representing top, the Democratic Party, top Democrats, and also running a lot of the election-related lawsuits recently. The lawyer on this was indicted on a single felony count. That's one. Okay, I'll get into why this is a big deal. It goes beyond this. A single felony count of making a false statement during a meeting with FBI General Counsel James Baker in September of 2016. Prosecutors allege that Sussman lied by denying he represented any client when he told the federal law enforcement agency about evidence that allegedly linked then-candidate Tr Donald Trump, uh, Trump's Trump Tower to a bank in Russia. Remember that story? Sussman met with Baker at ha to hand over papers and data files containing evidence of the alleged link between the Trump Organization and the Russian bank, which hasn't disclosed. Unconfirmed media reports have stated that it was Alpha Bank, A-L-F-A Bank. The indictment is a second criminal case, second one that Durham's brought forward. Since he was named by former Attorney General William Barr in 2018 to investigate officials who investigated the Trump-Russia probe, Durham, a former U.S. attorney, was asked to stay as a special counsel and continue his investigation after President Joe Biden's administration took office in January. Sussman, the indictment alleges, did not hand over the information as a good citizen, but rather as an attorney representing Clinton, a technology executive, and an internet company. Now, on this note, Durham is investigating the entire Crossfire Hurricane scandal, the entire Trump-Russia hoax scandal. As you remember, I won't go to the whole story, but basically Democrats in the DNC, Democratic Party in the DNC, Clinton campaign, uh, they hired companies to create essentially a dossier of fake information, the Trump-Russia dossier. That dossier was then used by different federal agencies to launch a probe into the Trump, the Trump team. And that led to many, many years of, well, fake stories, fake headlines, fake investigations, which turned up with, well, nothing other than a few people getting panicking and uh, lying under oath, nothing big. Now, what's really interesting with this latest uh, well, this case we're talking about right now is that, of course, this is just a case of one individual tied to Perkins Cooey, this law firm, lying, uh, lying to the FBI. But the way that this entire this, the way this entire lawsuit is laid out is not like most lawsuits of this nature are la are laid out. Normally, an indictment such as this would be very short. Normally, an indictment like this, I would just include you know some basic names of the basic story. What is interesting here is that it goes far, far beyond that. The indictment we're looking at from Durham names a whole lot of names, goes over a whole lot of information. A trend that you will commonly see, typically when a case is about to go down, of conspiracy, laying out a broad conspiracy. Um, this, this lawsuit, sorry, this charge uh, goes much further beyond what a normal case of someone lying to the FBI would entail. And the charges, again, wouldn't, you, wouldn't really, you wouldn't really have it be necessary to lay out this in much information normally. And normally you wouldn't actually do that. This indictment, this charge, this charge that's coming against this Perkin Coie lawyer um, is not normal, folks. So we'll see what happens with it. Uh, we'll see what happens with it. Something it might be going down. I don't want to promise anything, and this is just my analysis. Take it for what it's worth, right? Just my analysis. Take it for what it's worth. But this indictment is abnormal. This indictment, the way it is laid out, is not normal. It is unusual. And I can tell you as an investigative reporter, typically there's two things I look for when I want to find something worth investigating. Well, you look for patterns, and you look for anomalies within those patterns. You look for ways that things are commonly done, and if things break that normal protocol, usually means something else is going on. This charge against this Perkins Coie lawyer breaks protocol. 
this charge against him, the way it's laid out, goes against the common pattern. And it's following a pattern that we would see normally, again, if they're about to lay out a conspiracy charge. Now, take it for what it's worth. This is just my analysis on this, and we'll see what happens as we go forward. Uh, but folks, Durham has reemerged. The Apparently he's alive. Who knew? And uh, he's, he's brought forward his second charge now. We'll see what happens with it. And again, that's my take on it. We'll see what happens. Now that said, folks, I have mentioned we are still demonetized by YouTube, but luckily we do have sponsors. And tonight's episode is brought to you by American Hartford Gold. And with all the turbulence in the economy, which seems to be increasing, multi-trillion dollars in spending, a new $3.5 trillion spending bill, maybe more to come. Us giving money to the Taliban and many other issues very likely on their way. You can consider investing in an asset that tends to be both on the incline and also relatively stable. Those are gold and silver. American Hartford Gold is one of the highest rated firms in the country with an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. They can have your gold and silver delivered right to your doorstep or into your IRA. To learn more, you can check out the link in the description below where American Hartford Gold is providing a free 25-page information guide. And if you call them now, you can get up to $1,500 of free silver and all qualifying first orders. The number for that is 877-260-2764. Or you can text Joshua to 65532. And big thanks out to American Hartford Gold for sponsoring, sponsoring tonight's episode. Now, that said, folks, I want to talk a bit more about what's happening with these vaccine mandates and especially the way it may be impacting hospitals. Now, one of the narratives that's been used about why vaccine mandates are necessary is because people are talking about overcrowding in hospitals. You might have heard the line, Oh, there's limited numbers of ICU beds, intensive care unit beds, and you know if there's a if there's a crisis, if too many people get the get get the virus, and we have a pandemic again on our hands. Well, I guess we're technically in one still, technically, um, and doctors aren't able to administer care because they don't have enough staff. Well, that's going to be a pretty serious problem. But guess what? The vaccine mandates themselves appear to be causing the very problem they claim to be solving. Because, folks, a lot of doctors and healthcare workers overall are not getting the vaccine, meaning they're going to lose their jobs. And if they lose their jobs, what then happens? Well, you're going to have hospitals going out of business. You're going to have serious short staffing. And, folks, this is happening as we speak. Now, there's an interesting test case that's happening right now in France, which is about two months ahead of us here in the U.S. Remember, Biden just put down these policies. France has been going at this about two months and they're seeing a pretty serious problem because of it. Let's go into it. It says here, France fears medical staff shortages as 300,000 unvaccinated by September 15th deadline. And it says, going a bit further in the story, according to the country's health authority, 300,000 French employees active in the medical field, again, that's medical staff, 300,000 medical staff are not vaccinated. And some hospitals feel, fear staff shortages will add to their challenges, according to the Associated Press. And it says, it isn't clear if those workers will be fired immediately, as a top court has forbidden staff to be laid, out, laid off outright. But guess what? They're already doing it. Another story here detailing that. It says this, thousands of health employees, this is another story, thousands of health employees laid off in France over vaccine mandate. So folks... 300,000 uh, health medical field workers are not vaccinated in France. They're facing getting laid off if they refuse to get vaccinated. 300,000. Remember in France, too, you have these large-scale protests in the streets, well over 100,000. I've heard upwards of 140,000. Uh, some claim more. But, folks, 300,000 medical workers unvaccinated facing layoffs. And now here's what may happen to them. Thousands of health employees laid off in France over the vaccine mandate. About 3,000 French nationals working in the medical and care sector have been suspended from work for deciding not to get vaccinated against the CCP virus before a government-imposed deadline. France's Minister of Health announced on September 16th. Two months ago, this is where it's important for here in the U.S., two months ago, 
meaning that this is a testing ground for what we may be facing very soon. Remember, Biden just started this. Biden just announced policies like this. France has been at this for two months now, and here's what's happening. Two months ago, President Emmanuel Macron ordered hospital staff, ambulance technicians, nursing home workers, doctors, fire brigade members, and people caring for the elderly or infirm in their homes, some two, uh, at, or infirm in their homes, some 2.6 million employees in total to get a COVID-19 vaccine by September 15th. Now, the important part in that is, well, out of those 2.6 million people, 300,000 are not getting the vaccine as of yet. Thousands have now been laid off. More are facing it. And you're facing now medical shortages in the hospitals. Now, take in mind, keep in mind here in the U.S., not only have we now implemented this same policy, not only has the Biden administration put the same policy in, but we also have something else, which is mass immigration, upwards of 200,000 people crossing the border a month in the United States, just among those who have been caught. That means 200,000 roughly caught a month, not including those who were not caught. And what happens if you have 200,000 people coming into the country being promised free health care in many of the states in the U.S.? And even if not given free health care, they can still get it through the uh, emergency room system where they typically don't, don't even have to pay for it if you're not an American citizen. Well, if you're an illegal alien or if you're homeless, typically don't have to pay for it. What's going to happen, folks, if 40 percent of those people then have the virus? If 40 percent of 200,000 a month upwards have the virus? And what happens then if many of those hospital workers leave because they don't want to get vaccinated? And what happens then if hospitals have to close amidst all this? Uh, you're going to have something very interesting right in the midst of the 2022 elections. That's what happens. And here's what else might happen. Let's talk about what's happening in Texas. Texas hospital faces closure over COVID-19 vaccine mandate, according to the CEO. The chief executive of a hospital in Texas warned that his facility faces closure, closed totally, not just one part of it, the hospital closed, after President Joe Biden announced last week that most healthcare workers get the COVID-19 vaccine. If the mandate goes through, it's not fully pushed through yet, remember he, he only announced it, he hasn't actually implemented it fully, Brownfield Regional Medical Center CEO Jerry Jasper said that 20% of my probably 20 to 25% of my staff will have to go away if that's the case, reported KCBD. Losing those workers, he said, would likely cause his hospital to shut down. And losing medical, Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid money isn't an option either. Now, he's estimating that in the U.S., 20 to 25% of people, hospital workers, medical employees are not getting vaccinated. So in the U.S., it's 20 to 25 percent. And to, in France, where you already have this happening, remember that's four to five times, right? Four to five, uh, roughly one-fifth or one-fourth, right? In France, you have 300,000 of uh, just over 2.6 million, about what, one out of six, one out of seven, they're already having a crisis with greater vaccination rates among medical workers than here in the United States. They're already facing medical, uh, medical care crisis when it comes to staffing. The U.S. is about to roll this out. We're just at the start of it. France is two months in. You already have hospitals in the U.S. saying they're, they're going to have to close down based on this. Where are we heading, folks, in two months? You tell me. Now, something important to watch on this, and especially how it's used by different media organizations, because remember, remember, overcrowding of hospitals is one of the main narratives that has been used to pull the heartstrings of people and claim that there's a case, so there's a crisis going on. And frankly, folks, when you're not facing a crisis and you need one, what's the easiest way to do it? You create a crisis. Here we have them intentionally or unintentionally, very likely creating a crisis. Whether they mean to or not, this is going to be the outcome of it. We already see it happening. We already see a hospital in Texas saying they're closed down. You already have hospitals in New York. Uh, one of them in particular is Wendover recently saying that they no longer can even deliver babies because the workers who could deliver babies, there's only a few of them, aren't able to work because they won't get the vaccine. Now, where are we heading with this, right? Intentional or not, whether they meant to do this or did not mean to do it, 
the effect of this medical worker vaccine mandate is going to cause a shortage in medical staff, meaning, again, overcrowded hospitals, demand for health care that people cannot get. Now, watch carefully to see how this narrative is used as we go forward, because this is now the crisis that has been created. Watch how the crisis is used. Uh, typical Hegelian dialectics, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Create a crisis and then create the solution to the crisis you created, how it usually works. Now, folks, that said, of course, we're, we've been talking now about these vaccine mandates. And the next stage that a lot of people are concerned about is the booster shot mandates. And there's been mixed narratives about the booster shots. Here in the United States, they're saying uh, that you may not need a booster shot. They're claiming this. Uh, many, many different prominent voices. In Israel, they're mandating the booster shot because they already got enough people vaccinated. One of the main concerns is that once they reach the threshold that they want of people vaccinated, then the next step is going to be mandatory booster shots, not just vaccines. And then who knows what else? Maybe another booster shot uh, indefinitely, possibly. They're not really putting an end to this. But there are different voices on this. The problem with the different voices on it is that they contradict each other. Let's go over what they're saying. First of all, let's talk about Moderna. It says here, Moderna, one of the vaccine manufacturers, says booster COVID-19 shots may be required. And they cited new data on breakthrough cases. It says here just briefly, Moderna announced on Wednesday that its COVID-19 vaccine decreases in efficacy after a year. Some other studies have said some of the other vaccines after about three months, depending on the variant, Delta variant, I believe that particular number. And they're suggesting a the potential benefit in having a booster shot of its mnra vaccine now vaccine companies pfizer moderna have been saying you may need a booster shot but the fda is saying something different let's explain this hmm. tea tonight by the way is good old-fashioned ginseng tea honeysuckle and chrysanthemum it's a wonderful mix now, let's go into what's happening as well with this. So, vaccine companies saying, yeah, you need a booster shot. The vaccine companies are saying, look, the efficacy of the, of the, the efficacy of the vaccine that we're selling you, the one that we're giving you, fades after three months to a year. They themselves are saying it. The people selling the vaccine saying, hey, that vaccine I gave you, uh, the efficacy of it goes down. You're, it's not going to protect you as well. Three months to a year on, you need a, you need a booster shot. FDA and other agencies are saying otherwise. Now, this is about the Pfizer vaccine, according to the FDA, but they're saying this. FDA says Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine still effective. Boosters may not be needed. Says the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA on Wednesday, said that the agency authorized, the agency authorized COVID-19 vaccines currently provide protection against death and severe disease and may not require additional boosters. Coming after vaccine maker Pfizer submitted data saying its vaccine efficacy is eroding over time. So we talked about Moderna said that their vaccine erodes over time. Pfizer also saying the vaccine is erodes over time. The FDA is even contradicting the vaccine company itself by saying otherwise. And keep in mind as well that the one the the one that the FDA approved is not the one you're being given of the Pfizer vaccine. That one is currently not in circulation in the U.S. or currently not being administered in the U.S. That's an important note. But they're even contradicting the vaccine company itself, Pfizer, in this case. Now, it says here, in findings released online, the FDA analyzed data submitted by Pfizer as part of their request to authorize a booster shot or third dose of the vaccine to individuals age 16 and older in the United States. The agency did not make a definitive statement on whether to support booster shots at this time, adding that regulators have not reviewed the available data. Now, there, this is the important thing. FDA is contradicting Moderna and Pfizer. They're contradicting the vaccine manufacturers. They're also saying at this time, now we currently have vaccine mandates for the first wave of the vaccines. What would happen if they started mandating the second or third waves of the vaccines uh, being the booster shots? What then happens if they start mandating that? Very likely a lot of people who are wary about getting the vaccine are going to say, hey, why do I need a booster shot if the vaccine works? Hey, those companies are saying that 
the efficacy of the vaccine fades after three months to a year. Hey, why do you make me wear a mask? And why do I still face a risk if I get this vaccine? You say I need to protect my health. Very likely some of the concerns are going to be raised. Now, do you think they're going to get the vaccine if they're saying, yeah, you have to get this one and then you have to get the next one and then maybe the next one after that indefinitely until we say otherwise? Probably not. And so it seems to be the case that they're delaying it a little bit. It's unclear what their exact intention is, but they're delaying it. But guess what else? Happening in Israel right now. Remember, Israel was leading the numbers on getting people vaccinated. They're also leading people on uh, leading the world on requiring the vaccine booster shot. Now they're talking about the fourth shot. Remember, it's two to get started, one to boost you. Now they're talking about four. Four shots. Let's explain this. Israel sees record high daily infections, hints at fourth vaccine dose. It says here, highly vaccinated Israel recorded the highest number of daily CCP virus infections per capita this week as the country's health ministry announced that on average, more than 10,700 new COVID-19 cases are being reported each day. All right, folks, per capita, they were leading the one, one of the main leading countries of getting people vaccinated. How is the per capita highest number of cases happening in the place that also had some of the highest numbers of people getting vaccinated and vaccine mandates in place very early on, and even booster shot mandates now, and they're having per capita some of the highest numbers. Now, it continues a bit further into it, saying this. Vaccine, this is a quote, vaccines fade over time. And after six months, they significantly decline while people become infected even after two vaccines. Now, it's a quote from Health Ministry Director General Nasham Ash. He said this answering a question on the possibility of a fourth COVID-19 vaccine dose. In other words, do not answer the question directly, but did suggest it may be necessary. And so there are talks right now and concerns of, well, how long is this going to go for? Is this indefinite? Israel is suggesting it may be indefinite, at least four vaccines. All right, folks, first it was uh, two weeks to stop the spread. And now we're at uh, get your fourth vaccine or you can't go to the store. Um, now, that said, a few other interesting things I want to go into. I want to go into some issues with the vaccines themselves. Japan has some interesting updates on this. Uh, you might have heard the claims from as well. Nikki Minaj, this uh, hip hop artist talking about some of the issues she's witnessed and she's being faced facing the cancel culture mobs because of it. Going to be going into a lot of this, folks. Also, there's been talks about how the vaccines may affect women, including concerns that it may make women infertile. That you may not be able to have a baby if you get the vaccine. Uh, it's important to note that Snopes declared that that story was false, but false on a very specific play on words, that there were rumors going around that the vaccine, again, may cause women to become infertile. Now, the articles they were challenging, Snopes being this fact checker, quote unquote, uh, Snopes being this fact checker website, claimed that it was false. Not because they're saying that it's actually, it actually doesn't cause this, but because the articles saying that, well, it, may, it causes women to become infertile said it will cause them to, whereas the actual studies said it may cause them to. Another reason to read the fine print of some of these fact checker websites, because it was a very interesting jump in logic in the fine print that they're saying something is totally false because they said will instead of may. But there's an interesting new study coming out on the menstrual changes women are seeing after getting vaccinated. And it's, of course, raising some issues about their reproductive health, whether they can still have babies after they get vaccinated. I want to go into these stories in just a bit, folks, but it's getting we're getting to the halfway point, so I want to go into questions. So if you have questions, leave them in the chat. We'll try to get to them. It does help if you write question at the beginning of the question just so we can see them more easily. We don't have super chat anymore because we're demonetized. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, what are you going to do? Um, and so, folks, yeah, leave your questions in the chat. We'll try to get to them. Uh, first of all, though, well, as I mentioned, we're still totally demonetized. But if you want to support Crossroads, a great way to do it. 
Um, we do accept donations. You can find the link, our donor box link. We can, we also have Epoch TV or Epic TV. People have asked, is it Epoch, Epoch, or Epic? If you're an American, technically it's Epic. If you're British or Canadian, technically it's Epoch. And I just like to confuse people by saying Epoch because uh, it sounds more e easy to spell, frankly. <laughs> EpicTV.com forward slash crossroads. Uh, that's our new platform, Epic TV. We have a lot of movies there. We have shows there. We have documentaries there. Crossroads is on there. Our exclusive interviews are there. Whole lot going on. Our new series, The Dark Origins of Communism, is there. Our last documentary, um, America Rewritten, is there. More in the works. Hopefully going to be there very soon. And folks, be sure to check it out. I'll show you a quick trailer now of what we're working on. Communists establish power in Russia. In China specifically, I mean, how widespread is the practice of forced organ harvesting? We can assume that uh, forced organ harvesting is taking place in all, all over China. The main goal of this practice is to eradicate a group of Falun Gong practitioners. We call on the PRC to immediately cease its campaign against Falun Gong practitioners. What does forced organ harvesting look like? Killing of people for the purpose to harvest their organs while they are still alive. A large scope of uh, professions and people from the West are being pulled into this scheme and unknowingly or knowingly becoming accomplices. China can refer to prisoners of conscience as a livestock of organs, as a living pool of organ donors. In other countries, this is not the, the practice. All right, folks. So again, check it out, epictv.com, E-P-O-C-H-T-V.com. And if you put forward slash crossroads on there, it helps us. <laughs> so check it out, folks. Uh, you can find the link in the description and in the chat. Um, again, also, if you just want to check out some videos there, you don't want an account just yet, you can get a free trial. All you need is an email address. So check it out. And if you want to go the extra mile, give us a hand, help us out. Tell a friend or family member about it. It does help us. All right, folks, that said, let's jump into questions. So let's see here. First question is from Cameron Bacon. He said, Josh, have you ever looked at posts referenced by QAnon people? The media is quick to highlight fringe theories. The actual drops have a staggering amount of info. The site QAnon.pub is an archive of the drops. Documentary, perhaps? Yeah, so when that was, I don't know if it's still going on or not, but when it was, when it was a big thing, um, course i did i did some interviews on it when all the media were writing about it of course media were just attacking it writing it off i wanted to know what was actually happening so i just interviewed some people um i interviewed one of the moderators of the QAnon reddit page before they shut it down also a few other people basically just trying to figure out what they were talking about um i think it was a pretty moderate article people tend people seem to like it actually a lot of them thanked me for writing an article that was actually fair <laughs> And basically just said what they were claiming. Now, talking about the bigger issue with this, I know that since everything happened with the elections and allegedly, I, I honestly didn't follow them too closely, but allegedly since a lot of the predictions didn't come true, people said, hey, what happened? Um, the issue you have with this, I, I would say, I mentioned a few different things that now it's not clear exactly. I, I don't know whether it's real or not. I have no idea whatsoever. My big concern that I was citing pretty early on, though, is, well, it looked a bit like what you had ahead of the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, it was called Operation Trust, and it was a Soviet operation that actually functioned very much like this. Operation Trust. You can check out the book. Um, in fact, I think I have a copy of it. Let me see. No, I brought it to the office. Uh, it's called New Lies for Old. Um, it's a, it's a book again, it's an anti-Soviet book written pretty w a while back, new lies for old by Antony Galitsyn. Now it details in there an operation of the Soviets called operation trust. And essentially what the Soviets did was they convinced people that they were white Russian generals who are running a secret operation to basically fight against the Soviets. Turns out the whole thing was a Soviet plot basically to keep people trusting that something good was going on. 
and they didn't have to do anything, just sit around and well, listen to it, basically. <laughs> it seemed to be a lot like that. Now, I'm not trying to discount the information in any way. This was my big concern, though, because things like this have been done in the past. Operation Trust, Soviet operation, again, convincing the Russians that a group of white Russian generals were working on a secret operation to stop the Soviets. It was a Soviet operation, basically. Uh, really look into it. It's an interesting story. Um, and again, if you want to read the book that does talk about it, it goes into a lot of other things. It's called New Lies for Old by Golitsyn. That said, if you understand disinformation operations, and, and I'm not trying to discount anything here. I'm just saying just in general of why I'm, I, my way of looking at things, I don't tend to accept or reject things until I can prove or disprove them. But of course, I do weigh things through different lenses based on what I've researched and studied. Now, going into this just a bit, if you understand disinformation operations, typically the best disinformation operations actually use real information. And there's a reason for that. It's because you can use real information and just put in a little bit of falsehoods, even if the falsehood is just misleading people, even if the falsehood is just false hope like Operation Trust was under the Soviets. Um, it actually has the effect of discounting legitimate information. You can, put, you can put legitimate information into something. You can make all these legitimate claims and throw in a few grains of falsehoods. And those few grains of falsehoods are going to be used to delegitimize all the legitimate claims. In other words, you can take information that is damning you can take information that could destroy a, you know destroy people that if it was ever revealed to the public could actually cause a whole lot of damage and then make it public but sprinkle in false information and then in, in your media reports focus on the false information highlight that and use that false information that you yourself sowed to discredit the entire body of information um, it's a very easy way of doing things and this is a common basic way of running a disinformation operation. A uh, great book on that is Disinformation by Ion Mihai Pachepa and Ronald Reichlack. Uh, next question here. And in other words, my point is, just be, even if something is overall false, doesn't mean that someone may not have put true information in it in order to even try to discredit true information. Again, not saying, not proving or disproving anything. Uh, just in general. Uh, another question here is from JDB8625. He said, question, will American citizens ever see anyone actually prosecuted due to present political situation in America? You might. Um, John, you know, John Durham is a special case because he's a special counsel. We'll have to see how it goes. You still do have also majority of, well, technically Republican appointees in the um, in the Supreme Court, Nancy Pelosi recently said uh, to college kids during a speech that the Democrats actually do want to pack the courts. And so maybe they are concerned about something having to do with the the Supreme Court at the very least because the Supreme Court's blocking a lot of a lot of what they may like to do. Um, but when it comes to John Durham, there is a possibility. <laughs> Alan, he said, don't get your hopes up. Yeah. Have some hope, but have realistic hope. Let's put it that way. It's a possibility. Who knows at this stage? Frankly, with everything that's happened over the past year, you, you couldn't surprise me with anything. If anything were to happen, it would not surprise me at this point. Um, but yes, John Durham is a special counsel. Yes, there is a possibility that something can happen. A uh, special prosecutor. Yes, there's something. something could happen. Uh, not only that, but he could press charges against a lot of key players in the government. The interesting thing with this case, if, if he rolls it out, if John Durham goes not just against this one individual with Perkins Coie, but let's say launches a broader investigation to Perkins Coie itself, a law firm working with Democrat top Democrat leaders, and that suddenly leads to further investigations into other, one, other individuals connected to the Trump-Russia scandal, you're looking at so many high level US politicians that it would remake our government <laughs> in some ways. It would be massive. 
if if he wanted to fully roll it out. Um, it's unclear what he has, but as I mentioned, the nature of the Durham charge that was just brought forward, it was one individual with Perkins Cooey, again, on a very small charge, lying, well, big for this individual, but small in comparison to what people I think were hoping with it. Um, again, one individual lying to the FBI. What is interesting about it, again, is it names a whole lot of people. It names basically a conspiracy. It lays out the entire case. And that, folks, could open up a broader charge into conspiracy and many, many top-level figures in, our, in the government uh, possibly facing conspiracy charges because of it. We'll have to see. This is purely analysis. Take it for what it's worth. Purely analysis. But the indictment is not, not usual. The charge, the charge being brought forth, the way it was written out, is not usual. Again, it's written more like something to lay out a conspiracy charge. Not promising anything, just saying. Another question here again from Cameron Bacon. He said, question, Josh, based on your knowledge of how communism takes down a country, in America, how important are our localized community efforts across the country to battle the infection of communism? Extremely important because communism typically works. Uh, communism typically works through the grassroots. Now, let me, I'm not sure if I'm going to go too deep into this because it, I can go on forever with it. The, the mechanism that communist systems use to create movements actually I think goes over the heads of most people. It is called dialectical materialism. It's a Marxist strategy that incorporated elements of the Hegelian dialectic, which I mentioned earlier, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, crisis, solution to the crisis, essentially, and outcome from that. Uh, you can play it a lot, a lot of different ways. But dialectical materialism, the strategy under Marx, which you can understand is the metaphysical, it's a, it's a metaphysical concept. It's like a belief more than, than a system. Uh, works in the principles of identify, contradict, and eliminate the middle. If you understand that the real goal of communism isn't really an economic thing. In fact, the debates only ended on economics because communism was losing the debates on economics and sociology. Even in the early 1900s, communism was understood as a metaphysical system, as metaphysical belief. It was a belief, right? Uh, one that was impractical because in economics and sociology it was basically non-functional, as we've seen as it played as it has played out. But if you understand from that perspective, communism is basically meant to remake man in the image of man, destroy tradition, destroy morals, destroy culture and remake mankind and without God, essentially. That's the goal in a nutshell. The method they use to do that uh, is under this idea of, again, dialectical materialism, identify, contradict, eliminate the middle. You identify any value in society. You identify anything in society. You take that value, you take that moral principle, you take that cultural element, and you flip it upside down. What is the opposite of the institution of marriage? What is the opposite of, let's say, friendly relations between men and men, women and women, men and women, children and parents? You take all these things and you flip them upside down. And then you create political movements around the inversion. And you essentially use an, an inverted, if you understand like um, evil systems, essentially you're manifesting evil in society. You're creating, you're creating contradiction essentially, right? You're creating contradiction. Through the creation of contradiction, you then agitate the existing values and existing systems of the society. Uh, they also have the idea of uh, eliminate the middle. You eliminate the middle. In other words, you force people to choose one extreme or the other. You're with us or you're against us. That was Lenin's partisanism. Um, those who accuse us are themselves accused, as the leaders of the French Revolution said. Now, what happens then if people are pushed to one extreme or the other? Well, you get two opposites that then struggle and people then may sacrifice some of their values, be reasonable and say, yeah, you're right. You know what? I'll meet you halfway, even though you may still attack me for it. I'll be a moderate. And then you sacrifice half of your values. You lose half the principles of your culture. You lose half the principles of your religion. And they just keep doing it. That is the communist dialectic at play. And through this, they wither away the morals, traditions, and values of a society. This is how communism manifests movements. 
And this is also why when you take it and you apply it to in, in any individual country, any country in the world, you get a different version of it. This is why you have Leninism, Stalinism, Marxism, Maoism, uh, Duganism, <laughs> fascism, Nazism, all of which are different interpret were different interpretations of socialism, communism. Um, this is how it plays out. And I should note as well that the next version, uh, the next video we have in our history of communism series, The Dark Origins of Communism, is going to go into how Nazism and fascism are both socialist systems rooted in communism. So check it out, folks. Um, I could go on about that all night. Uh, another question here, then we'll go into some more stories. This is from Lupgaru666. He said, Joshua, can you or your people at Epic Times look into what happened to Veronica Wolski? It seems she may have been made an example of. I have not heard of Veronica Wolski, but I will make a note of her, and I'll look into it. Thank you, folks. Um, all right, let's uh, jump into some more stories because there's a few more stories I want to go into. I want to talk about the vaccines themselves and some of the issues coming up with it. Now, folks, it says this. While floating, can, white, sorry, white floating contaminants found in Pfizer vaccine in several Japanese cities, according to officials, this is interesting because Japan has really been finding a lot of contaminants within the vaccines. They previously said they found black substance floating the vaccines, what they believed were contaminants, and they linked some deaths to those contaminants. Now they're saying they're finding white floating contaminants in some of the vaccines. Uh, Japan is currently looking into some of these things. Let's talk about, let's go into what they're talking about. It says here, foreign matter, again, this substance they're finding in the vaccines has been discovered in five unused vials. It's only five of them. Let's go into it. Five unused vials of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine near Tokyo, Japan, and one vial in Osaka Prefecture, officials said on Tuesday. The vials containing white floating matter belong to the same vi Pfizer vaccine lot, said the cities Sagama, Sagimihara and Kamakura and Sakai, according to the Kyoto News Agency. They requested that Pfizer should review these substances in the vials. Now, continuing a bit further into the article, it says this. Several weeks ago, the Japanese health ministry suspended 1.63 million doses of Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine due to contamination. Black matter they found floating in the Moderna vials, white matter they're now finding floating in the Pfizer vials. It says this, weeks later, government officials in early September confirmed that three people died after receiving a shot from the since-suspended batches of Moderna's vaccine, which uses similar MNRA, sim, I'm sorry, mRNA technology as Pfizer's. An investigation later revealed that stainless steel particles or particulates had contaminated the Moderna vo uh, doses. The two firms traced it back to a production site in Spain. Now, on this note, interesting claim here. And while Japan is looking into these things, while Japan is, re is recording deaths caused by contaminants, they believe, within the virus. Uh, folks, Nikki Minaj is decrying cancel culture now because she criticized the vaccines. And she's also comparing the cancel culture mobs to what she saw in China. Now, it says this. It's going to what she's talking about. It says, as White House officials responded to Nicki Minaj, as, again, the White House responded to this entertainer, right? As White House officials responded to Nicki Minaj's claims on Twitter that the COVID-19 vaccine led to an adverse health, health problem, the rap star later said she is being targeted for asking questions about the shot and compared the phenomena to, chi to the Chinese regime's censorship. Minaj has 22 million followers on Twitter alone wrote on Monday that her cousin in Trinidad wouldn't take the vaccine because his friend got it and became impotent. She also shared a claim from a man who said he developed a blood clot in his eye after getting vaccinated. On Wednesday, Biden, the Biden administration's COVID-19 advisor, Anthony Fauci, as everyone remembers, Dr. Fauci, responded to her, an entertainer, again, 
to her assertion and told CNN that there is no evidence that it happens, nor is there any me mechanistic reason to imagine, uh, sorry, yeah, to imagine that it would happen. So it seems here that Fauci is alleging that nobody's ever had complications of this nature from these vaccines. Now, he added that Minaj should be thinking twice about making such claims online. For her claims, Minaj, who, had, who added that she isn't vaccinated, said she received significant criticism and suggested that she is now a target of a cancel culture mob for her tweets, asserting in an Instagram video that the phenomena is similar to the Chinese Communist Party's restrictions on visitors and citizens. And she said this, I remember going to China and they were telling us, you know, you cannot speak out against, you know, the people in power there, etc. Minaj said in an Instagram live video, and she said this as well. Don't you all see that we are living now in that time where people will turn their back on you? But people will isolate you if you simply speak and ask a question, she continued. So, folks, she's saying that she's not getting the vaccine based on her own concerns. She's saying she had a, again, friend of a friend say that he, be he became impotent after getting the vaccine. And again, another individual saying he had a blood clot in his eye after getting it. There are many claims like this. Dr. Fauci came out and criticized her, uh, claiming that, that he seems to believe that nobody has ever faced complications like this. And she is now being attacked by cancel culture mobs on Twitter. Now, this being said, speaking of, uh, speaking of people becoming impotent, there's now a study going on on this. It says menstrual changes. This is in women facing changes in the menstrual cycle, allegedly caused by the vaccine. Again, after the COVID vaccination should be actively invest investigated according to a rep uh, reproductive immunologist. It says here, the possible link between CCP virus vaccinations and menstrual changes should be investigated to clear up the doubts a reproductive immunology lecturer from Imperial College London said. In an editorial published on Thursday in the British Medical Journal, Dr. Victoria Mail said, fa said failing to thoroughly investigate reports of menstrual changes after CCP virus vaccination will likely fuel fears that the vaccines will hurt women's chances to have children. According to the editorial, by September 2nd, more than 30,000 cases 30,000 cases of menstrual disorders and unexpected vaginal bleeding after vaccination had been reported in the UK alone to the medicine to the medicines healthcare products regulatory agency uh, their yellow card surveillance scheme for adverse drug reactions so folks 30,000 reports to the official yellow card surveillance scheme in the UK claiming to have this problem and again, that's just in the UK, 30,000 cases. Now, it's not yet being investigated. We don't really know much beyond just the people reporting it. But it doesn't seem that anybody's actually investigating this right now. But again, 30,000 UK alone. Now, this said a few more stories. Now, a lot of people who may be wary about getting the vaccine are actually looking into other things, such as the monoclonal antibody crunch and again this is basically people who don't want the normal vaccine they're being given but they may they you know they're interested in getting immune to the vaccine and so they're looking into these antibody treatment getting the antibody treatment but guess what the biden administration is now putting restrictions on the ability of you to get that treatment if you wanted to get again the treatment that many states are doing they've now they're now rationing doses of this. Again, something that is shown to be effective. Why would they do this? Let's go into it. It says here, some states are set to receive fewer doses of monoclonal antibody treatment after the Biden administration switched the distribution system this week. Demand for monoclonal antibodies used to treat non-hospitalized COVID-19 patients has shot up in recent weeks, leading to what some officials have described as a shortage the Biden administration tipped off states in early September that it was limiting distribution of the treatment before it abruptly switched on September 13th from letting sites directly order the doses to putting the federal government in charge of the allocation to states. In other words, they're, 
tightening it they're squeezing it they're making they're making it harder for states to get it because states used to be able to get it directly now the federal government is putting itself between the states and the organizations that can get them these treatments and then they can choose where to send these treatments some state officials said they weren't even notified of this change until late september 13th when the actual switch was made it was very rapid why would they do that again a treatment that is shown to work they're not banning it they're not criticizing it but they put themselves in the middle of it and there's now what they're saying is a shortage of them after the government suddenly intervened the federal government intervened in states abilities to get monoclonal, uh, monoclonal antibody treatment very strange story now, also, folks, you, we have a possible shortage within our medical staffing at hospitals. Very soon, you may see something similar happen in the U.S. military. And I'll explain why that's a big deal as well. It says here, U.S. Army sets a deadline for COVID-19 vaccines threatens disciplinary action. Now, there's been reports of people in our military actually just walking out, essentially. Uh, but... A lot of people, just like in medical, medic, just like medical workers, don't seem to want to get the vaccine, including in the military. And this is could, this could lead to some interesting things, especially as we see some looming challenges and threats from the Chinese Communist Party, North Korea, Iran, ISIS, Al Qaeda, and maybe a few others thrown in there as well. It says here, the U.S. Army has announced deadlines for COVID-19 vaccines for all its service members threatening suspensions for those who don't have a pending exemption request and fail to comply. In a September 14th statement, the Army announced that all active duty troops must be fully vaccinated by December 15th. Bit out, but not too far away now. And that all other service members, National Guard and Reserve, have until June 30th, 2022, to get the vaccine. Now, Again, because many people who are healthcare workers, medical workers, don't want to get the vaccine, you're seeing actually a lot of shortages. You're seeing some hospitals talking about closing. You're seeing different wings of hospitals not able to service patients. Again, even uh, unable to deliver babies at one particular uh, hospital in New York. What's going to happen, folks, if those same numbers happen in the U.S. military? If, as they're claiming with the hospital workers, 20 to 25 percent choose to not get the vaccine and the military tends to be a little more conservative and uh, currently conservatives, I think, are maybe more wary about the vaccine than Democrats. And so what if it's 20, 20, 20, 25 percent or even higher U.S. military personnel decide not to get it? Then what happens now? What happens is we could be facing issues with our military right is something very interesting is happening because the chinese communist party is upping its game with making threats now very briefly on this you have some very big shifts now happening uh one interesting shift is that you remember this um this quad uh this quad alliance between india japan the united states and australia taking a stand against china you now have a similar security partnership between the United States, the United Kingdom, the UK, and Australia uh, that are taking a stronger stance against the CCP, including trying to get Australia some nuclear submarines. New Zealand is actually pushing back against Australia, saying that if Australia gets nuclear subs, they won't be allowed in New Zealand waters. The European Parliament is calling for a tougher stance against the CCP, including actually taking pretty strong stances on calling out their human rights abuses and also announcing a new program that's going to try to fight back against the CCP's debt trap diplomacy policy under its One Belt, One Road initiative. At the same time, Taiwan is boosting arms spending to $8.7 billion, saying that this is because of a major threat from China and Japan also suggesting they may defend Taiwan is holding large scale drills for the first time since 1993. Again, citing threats from the Chinese Communist Party. North Korea, meanwhile, is filing ballistic missiles again into the waters between Japan and the Korean Peninsula. Uh, there's word out claiming that the cruise missiles they have may have been given to them or assistance was given to them to build them by both China and Iran. And 
And North Korea is also uh, unveiling what they say are railway borne missiles, that they can have missiles launched from railways. And Xi Jinping, the head of the Chinese Communist Party, is also doing large reforms within the Chinese military, including a reshuffling of his generals, which appears to be a power grab uh, in the analysis of some folks. And this is all happening, folks, as we're facing issues within our own military, not just an ideological semi-purge under this critical race theory narrative where they're launching investigations into, into again, uh, our military personnel, but also talking about disciplinary action if our military personnel choose to not get vaccinated. It's unclear what the number is in the military, but again, hospital staff, which tend to be, I would say, maybe a little more liberal, maybe, maybe frankly believe in vaccines a little more given the fact that they're doctors, nurses, and hospital staff. Maybe they believe in the medical system a little more. Think of, again, 20 to 25% 20 among them. How does that apply to the military? And if they choose to not get vaccinated, and we're already, again, seeing uh, shortages of staff, how is this going to play out, folks? A lot to watch, a lot of questions to ask, but it's getting late, and we're going to call it a night here. Folks, as always, I do these live Q&As every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, so be sure to tune in again our next episode, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. In the meantime, you can check out the interviews we're publishing. We have a lot of good stuff in the works. Um, folks, I'll be back on again this coming Sunday, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. As always, as well, if you want to support Crossroads, a great way to do it. We do have donor box in the description below. Again, we're demonetized by YouTube, so it's it's all you keeping us going. Um, and also, folks, we do have our own platform, Epic TV, e p o c h t v dot com. If you want to go the extra mile to help us out, tell a friend or family member about it. It does help us a lot. You can also like and share this video, which also helps us a lot. And folks, that said, always appreciate your support. Always enjoy doing these. As always, please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you.